Hello, everyone, and welcome back to To Be Like Christ for our Bible study in the Gospel of Luke. We are in chapter 15. We are on page 63 in the notes. So if you don't have the notes, go ahead and grab those from our links down in the description. Either a book like I've got in front of me or there are digital files as well. So this chapter can kind of be broken down into three sections. Verses 1 through 7 is the parable of the lost sheep. Verses 8 through 10, the parable of the lost coin. And verses 11 through 32 is the parable of the prodigal son. So in this this video, we're going to talk about verses 1 through 10, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. Okay, so let's read verse 1 through 3. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he told them this parable. So the parable in chapter 15 is told in response to this attitude that the Pharisees and the scribes have. You know, they didn't like the idea that the Messiah was going to spend time with Pharisee or uh, with them, um, with sinners, with tax collectors, with kind of what they thought was like the the bottom rung of society. Definitely the people who were very far away from God. These religious leaders had a lot of misconceptions, as we've already observed, and this was one of them, that God wouldn't have time for people like this. And these parables exposed how incorrect they were in that thinking. And they teach us about the nature of Jesus' work and the nature of God. So verses 4 through 7 now. And this is the first parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And... When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying with them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep, or for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Adam Clark, who had more experience with sheep than I have had, uh, he writes this in his, his commentary. No creature strays more easily than a sheep. None is more heedless, and none so incapable of finding its way back to, back to the flock. When one's gone astray, it will bleat for the flock and still run in an opposite direction to the place where the flock is. This I have often noticed. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the scribes, If a shepherd had a hundred sheep, but one got lost, wouldn't that shepherd leave the ninety-nine safe sheep and uh, go off and find the lost one? And I don't know a whole lot about shepherding, but Jesus made this decision sound like it would be like common sense to any shepherd. Like, of course he would leave and, and go looking for the other sheep. And when the shepherd found the sheep, he'd put it over his shoulders and he'd take it back to the flock. And this was a common image in the ancient world. In fact, on the notes... In the notes on page 64, I have a stone carving of a man with a sheep thrown over his shoulders, and it's from the ancient world. So this was a, apparently this was something that shepherds did, and I, I mean, they still very well might, I don't know. When the shepherd found his sheep, he would tell all of his friends the good news, and they would be happy for him, and rejoice with him. So what's the interpretation? What are we meant to take away from this, or what were the... What were the people meant to take away from it? Well, these verses describe God's love for the lost using a very simple illustration. Jesus was the shepherd. The lost sheep represented those who are spiritually lost, those who had wandered away from God. And in this context specifically, it represented the tax collectors and the sinners. The reason, the whole reason that Jesus had come to earth was to save lost people. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus didn't have to die to save righteous people. I mean, that wouldn't make sense. So, of course, Jesus was going to spend time with sinners. They were the ones that he was after. And uh, what the, the Pharisees and the scribes didn't realize and failed to realize was that they needed Jesus just as much as those who they considered great sinners. They were as far away from God, they were as far away from the shepherd and the safety of the flock as the tax collectors and the sinners were. 
But Jesus spent some time with the tax collectors and sinners because they were actually receptive of what he had to say versus the Pharisees and the the scribes and the lawyers and the Sadducees who thought that they had their own kind of self-righteousness that they could depend on. So the lesson is probably, uh, well, the lesson is the Pharisees and the scribes would have never criticized a shepherd for going off to find a lost sheep. And yet, they were constantly criticizing the good shepherd, Jesus, for spending time with the lost and trying to bring bring them back into a safe, friendly communion with God. I think the misconception of the Pharisees and the scribes had here, uh, it was, I, I think that they they thought that the Messiah would come and he would spend time with religious people like them. People who, at least in on the exterior, honored God. The Messiah was going to come and just like pat them on the back, but that wasn't Jesus' mission. And uh, they were very wrong about that. Verse 7. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So when a sinner returns, there's more rejoicing in heaven than 99 righteous people. Now, Jesus here is not saying that the Pharisees and the scribes and Sadducees are righteous people. They believe themselves to be, but they're actually not. But Jesus is speaking about the importance and the the... Well, the importance that heaven puts on the return of sinners, the return of lost sheep. And I kind of struggled with this verse at first when I read it, uh, and it took me a while to kind of get my head wrapped around it. And Maybe I can be helpful in helping other people understand as well. So Jesus said that there's more joy in heaven when a sinner repents than over 99 people who don't need repentance. So the question that I always had was, well, why does God rejoice more over a sinner who repents than over faithful believers who never leave the fold? Does God love them more? Does God love the sinners more? And I think the answer is no. God doesn't necessarily love the faithful less. So what is this text saying? Well, maybe we can illustrate it with a personal experience or something that may happen to in our everyday lives. So let's say you're going to buy your friend a gift for his birthday, which costs a thousand dollars. You're a good friend. <laughs> and um, yesterday you had all of your money in your wallet, but today you notice that a hundred dollars of that a thousand dollars is missing. So you're worried because the time of the party is approaching and you have to go buy this gift and you don't have the money that you you thought you had. Upon realizing that one-tenth of your money is missing, what are you going to do? Well, you're probably going to tear apart your house, uh, searching for it in every little crevice and all the pockets of the pants that you've worn for the last week and in the washer and the dryer. (laughs) Let's say that you do that and after 20 minutes you find that money, you find the the missing $100 under like a package of Girl Scout cookies that you were eating last night. (laughs) How do you feel? Well, you feel relieved. Your heart is full of momentary joy because you found what was lost. What would you have done if you had never found it? Well, you don't know, but the stress of that has now been taken off of your shoulders. So your worry is lifted and you rejoice because of it. Now, are the the $900 in your wallet, are they loved less because you found the missing $100? The answer is no. Your joy in them has been steady, and it's been constant and consistent. Your joy in the missing $100 is elevated. It's momentarily more potent because you were worried for its safety. The others, you know, the other $900, it was was safe. It was accounted for. Uh, But the missing $100 was in limbo, right? And when you find it, you realize, ah, yes, you know, We've brought it back to safety. Now I can accomplish what I intended to do with it. And I think that's the idea with with what Jesus is expressing here. The lost one is outside of safety. And so there is a relief and a joy and a rejoicing when it is brought into safety with the others. This text teaches us about the value that God places on the individual. 
God isn't content with just having large numbers of people worshiping him. He isn't satisfied when the number of his followers reaches a particular number and then, you know, he only concerns himself again when it falls too low. The Bible tells us that God desires all men to be saved and he cares about each human being on an individual level. He's not just interested in the world collectively. He's interested in you specifically and whether or not you're safe in his fold or not. So he knows you. And in one sense, Jesus died for the entire world to offer it salvation. But in another sense, Jesus died for you personally. And God knows you. He created you. Uh, and the way that he looks at you is not just as a number among the masses, but as the individual who he has uniquely created you to be. And he cares about your relationship to him. So much so that... Uh, he provides this illustration about how one is important even among a hundred. An application, and I guess a thought from this text. The church, collectively, needs to be concerned about individuals and not just numbers. I know it can be easy, especially for large churches, to lose track of individuals who leave and fall off the path or you know, go off and get lost back in the world because, well, there's plenty of people and their pews are still relatively full and you don't necessarily notice the impact when you miss one or two people. If we're part of a congregation of 100 people and one lady stops showing up, how does our congregation respond? Do we say, well, you know, didn't even notice she was gone. <laughs> well, we got 99 others here and I'm sure we can pick up one or two somewhere else and yeah, we'll be fine. Or do we say, you know, we've got to go help that one lost sheep? Some, congrega some congregations grow so large that keeping track of one individual can be difficult. Now, is that excusable? What, what do you think the good shepherd would say if, he, if we express that attitude to him? Would he be pleased with, with it? Uh, I, I think probably not. And when we talk about congregational responsibilities, what we're really talking about is, uh, well, what those really boil down to is the individuals who are taking, taking responsibility over that. Right? So we personally need to be thinking about how do I reach out to those who are lost and how do I reach out to those who are maybe walked away from the church after having been a part of it because, you know, God cares about these individuals and we are the the hand his hands and feet if you want to use that terminology to do his work and so we work as the shepherd going out and finding the lost and bringing them back to the safety of of jesus uh, in in a way so what am i what am i personally doing to respond to the care the the, the care that the good shepherd has for every single individual in the world all right verses eight through ten or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So this, this second parable continues on the theme of the first one. A woman had 10 silver coins, but one got lost. Now, most countries today are larger, our larger denominations of money are usually represented with paper money rather than coins. Most of us wouldn't care too much if we lost a nickel or a dime, but uh, they didn't have paper money in those days. Coins often did represent larger values of money. So don't imagine this is like a five or 10 cent coin that's worth, you, that you can't actually buy anything with. It's very possible that this was something of greater value. It may have been a, a denarius coin, which from some of the other stories in the Gospels we learn was somewhat representative of a day's labor. So you're talking maybe, you know, 50, 150, 250 dollars, something like that. It's a big, it's a lot of money. <clears throat> so all that to say, this was potentially very significant. The woman searched diligently for the money until it was found and then went and told her friends that she had found what was lost and they rejoiced with her. 
So in verse 10, Jesus compared the joy and the relief of finding something lost to the rejoicing that goes on in heaven when the angels learn that a lost person has been saved. <clears throat> so an application. There are days when our work for the Lord can seem insignificant, like nobody cares or pays attention to what we're doing. But evidently, the spiritual beings appreciate those who preach the gospel and whose lives are changed by that preaching. I mean, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Um, some days it just feels like, man, I'm not making any progress. I'm not doing anything great. I'm not contributing in any big way. But here, this small thing is accomplished, the finding of something that was lost, right? And although it may seem small, to us, and maybe our work seems small to us, the the angels of heaven, the beings in the spiritual world are taking note of what we are accomplishing, and it is cause for rejoicing among them. So don't think that your work isn't appreciated or isn't valuable. When we think about the interpretation of this parable, the meaning is largely the same as, as the last. God wants sinners to turn from their sins and to return to him. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, This is a good thing, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We've referenced that verse a couple times now. So Jesus was spending time with sinners because he cared about their souls. The Pharisees and the scribes didn't care about the lost. They didn't spend any, well, which was reflected in the fact that they didn't spend any time with the sinners. They had just kind of written them off as no-gooders. But Jesus was diligent about recovering what had been lost to sin and Satan, just like the woman was with the lost coin. So that will do us for this video, kind of a shorter one. Let's see, about 17 minutes. Uh, and we will talk about the parable of the prodigal son. And that will take us just about... Well, that will take us all the way through verse 32 in the end of chapter 15. So, Lord willing, in the next video, that's what we will discuss. It's a pretty well-known story, and uh, hopefully we can draw some applications out of it that maybe you haven't thought of before, or maybe you need to be reminded of that you've heard in the past, and uh, definitely a lot that we can learn there. So we'll talk about that in the next one. Until then, um, I will see you guys later.